Hey, we'd like to thank you for joining us and like to really hit the ground running with you today because uh, today's uh, teaching, today's message, I think is such a game changer for all of us. As you think about life uh, for a moment, I, I really kind of have a little bit of a, an assessing tool that I use with people. Uh, a mature person sees life one way and an immature sees life um, another way. I- immaturity to me is seen essentially when someone sees life and destinations. It's like, if I can just get to this point, then it'll be good. And what, what they realize is when they finally get there, um, it's fall, it falls way short of what they'd hoped. And what I would say about maturity, maturity says life is not destinations. Life is actually a journey. And, and, and along the journey, we do have in, uh, destinations that we, we visit, but it's not just about arriving. It's about the journey even in between the destinations of life. I'll give you an example. When you're young and uh, immature, maybe your mom or dad uh, might discipline you for something that you did wrong. And at that moment, you're thinking, man, I guess maybe my parents hate me because they disciplined me. And you you think it as a destination, an isolated event. But as you begin to grow up and begin to mature, you begin to see it differently. You say, well, you know, my parents did discipline me and maybe I did deserve it or not. But at the end of the day, I also see it in the grand scheme of my life, that there have been many years when they've loved me and many years they've encouraged me and many years when they've been a part of my life. So this isolate, this event is not isolated. This event is a part of this larger story they're doing and experiencing with me. And it's important as we talk about God today, as uh, we look at a story that we see life as a journey. Now, if you're just joining us or maybe you forgot where we've been for the last couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, we looked at Saul. We saw, uh, you know, that Saul was on this journey that we're talking about, that that life is a journey. And we saw with Saul that um, he learned that, that sometimes God you know, encounters us, and and his intent is to teach us something that we don't already know. Saul was convinced he was pursuing God. Saul was convinced he was living for God by killing Christians and responsible for them being put in prison. But at the end of the day, God just literally confronted him and said, listen, what you're doing is not what I would have you to do at all. In fact, you're persecuting me, said the Lord. And so Saul learned something powerful that what he thought had been true was not true at all. And then the next week we gathered, we talked about Ananias. There are those moments when God chooses you to do something you don't want to do. And and Ananias began to negotiate with God and explain to God maybe some things he thought God did not yet know. And again, you and I have been there. Like Saul, God teaches us something we didn't know. And Ananias, God calls us to do something we just didn't don't want to do. And then there's another guy in the story I'd like us to look at. His name is uh, is Barnabas. And we're going to really take his story and bring it down to this one statement that actually Paul wrote in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He said that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you and for me to do. And as, as you begin thinking about your life, Not only is it a life of of a journey, not only is it a life of learning, it's not only a life of doing, but it's a calling. In fact, I'd like to sum it up this way, that uh, as Barnabas encounters God, what my hope is, is that you'll see that God leads us to do what He's planned us to do, that that God's had a plan for your life and mine for longer than we can imagine, quite literally from what we would call um, the beginning of time. And so what we're going to do is look at Barnabas' story and how God prepares us for our callings as we go through this. And the first one I want you to see is that God plays an incredible role in our design, whether it's our personality, whether it's our capabilities, whether it's our abilities, our spiritual gifts, uh, whatever other things might come to mind, God plays a role in that. And so God says, all right, so I'm going to engineer you in a unique way, and I'm going to leverage that uniqueness in you into a calling. And when we're first introduced to uh, Barnabas, we're introduced to him as being a Levite. He's from Cyprus, and uh, the apostles called him Barnabas, which means encouragement. And so he actually sold a field of property, took the money, and gave it to the church. He literally put it 
uh, at the apostles' feet for them to use it however they needed to use it, however they felt led. And so we can know as a Levite, he probably was a Jew, Jewish man of great wealth. So he sold some land and, and he gave it, uh, the money from that. And so we understand something unique about Barnabas, that he was a, a real guy, a generous man, a man of encouragement. And so God's going to say, I'm going to leverage all those ingredients you have in a powerful way. Now, in the church where Barnabas was, from time to time, that happened. From time to time, landowners would sell their land and give the money to the church and put it at the apostles' feet for them to do as needed to be done. So Barnabas was a man of integrity, a man of an example setter, a man worth following. Now, the contrast we're not going to look at in detail is actually with Acts chapter 5. And in Acts chapter 5, there's a couple who sells land keeps some of the proceeds back and gives some of the money and and gives it in such a way that it looks as if they've given all of it. And the contrast is between Barnabas being the genuine real deal, the real guy, and this couple who was not. So again, as you think about your life, how has God engineered you? How has God wired you? How has God gifted you uniquely to serve? Because the odds are in that identity, you'll find a calling God has. Number two, as we look at it together, God prepares us for our calling with what I would call strategic relationships. When I was younger, uh, I often thought my relationships were coincidental or just kind of happenstance, just just happened to work out that way. But one time, one day, I finally realized that the relationships God allowed me to have, many were what I would call strategic people whose paths crossed mine at some point along the way, and somewhere down the road, I will realize how strategic that really had been. Now, again, as you're thinking of Barnabas, we go back to Acts chapter 9, and Saul comes to Jerusalem. Uh, Remember, Saul had had his life changed by the Lord, once a terrorist, now a, a minister, now a missionary, now a pastor. And he comes, he tried to join the disciples, They were afraid. Why? They did not believe what had happened. They just didn't think he really was a disciple. He there might have, they thought he had ulterior motives. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and he told told them about Saul's story. So, So the question we would need to ask, why was Barnabas willing to do that when these other disciples, these other followers of Christ were not? What what made Barnabas feel so comfortable that he did uh, what he did. Well, uh, many, many people believe that both Barnabas and Saul, as Jewish stu- you know, scholars, as they did what they did, uh, we've seen that uh, Barnabas was a Levite. We know Saul's uh, journey is a Pharisee. Their paths crossed under the great teaching of the great Rabbi Gamaliel. And, and whether they were there at the same time or a different time, we don't know, but we, the, mo- many, many uh, scholars believe that they knew each other from that point. And so when, when uh, Barnabas saw Saul and heard his story, he remembered his own. He remembered his own journey as someone who studied the Jewish faith. He remembered his own story and all of his perspectives of what he thought Christians were. And he remembered his conversion moment when he had his own moment, his own encounter with the Lord. Now, now you might think, well, if they were different in ages, how would Barnabas know about Saul? Well, we, we go back to the book of Galatians chapter 1, and we know something interesting about Saul. He was not just a guy who went to class. He, he wasn't just a guy who attended the school. Look at it carefully. He was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age. He, he was a guy who was zealous for all that he was learning. He indeed was a guy people took note of like literally a superstar. And so we go back to Acts chapter 9, and look at what it says. He told the apostles, here's what happened to Saul. He had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him. And obviously in in Barnabas' mind, this must have been something that had happened to him. And so he resonated in understanding Saul because of a relationship he had had with him previously. So we move on to number three. Is our response to God, our preparations for our calling often flows out of God Uh, you know, leading us to become credible, that our credibility opens up the callings that God would have us, have us to pursue. And again, we go back to the book of Acts and we look at chapter 11 and something was amazing happening, taking place in the city of Antioch. 
Some people had come there, told the good news, and the church began to grow. Amazing things happened. And these people were not of Jewish heritage. They were non-Jews or Gentiles. And they were trusting Jesus and believing in Him. And something amazing was happening. So the, the headquarters in Jerusalem said, we've got to find out if this is indeed a valid church, if this is really something of God. So we look at Acts chapter 11, and they sent Barnabas. They sent Barnabas to Antioch to find out if indeed what was happening there truly was of, of the Lord. And we learn in chapter 11, verse 24, that as a result of that, Barnabas, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people, they were brought to the Lord. He had credibility. Credibility in the eyes of the headquarters at Jerusalem, and now credibility in the people's eyes there uh, in Antioch. And so Barnabas, his life was genuine. It was real, an encourager, a generous man. And we see uh, that his life had grown to be something of credibility, growing credibility in the eyes of people. Now, listen, credibility is not something automatically granted. Credibility is something that's earned. So what did Barnabas do? Well, we go back to our last point, relationships. Immediately, Barnabas went to Sarsus and he went there to look for Saul. And he brought Saul back to Antioch, and there they taught the church, and the church got, got even bigger, and they were teaching large, great, grand numbers of people as these two men were together. Barnabas using his generosity, his encouragement, using his credibility, using the relationship he had had previously, all swirling together to the calling they had to, to do this in this season, to teach a great number of people God's truth of love and grace. So, so th think about your life for a minute. Where are you growing in credibility? Are you growing in credibility? Is your life growing where people determine you to be more credible in a specific area? And, and remember, credibility is not granted. Credibility is earned. So we move on to number four, and we discover this fourth part, that, that God calls us to specific tasks and assignments that sometimes it's, it's a moment, it's something that we do. Sometimes it might be a change of our entire lives and sometimes in between. But we want to understand uh, what that, that God called Barnabas and Saul to go. They're there in the church at Antioch. They're teaching large numbers of people. People are coming to faith. The church is growing. People are understanding it more and more. Amazing things are going on. Amazing things are taking place. And then we come to Acts chapter 13 and we see what God says. God says, okay, there's a great leadership team there in Antioch. And he says, I'm, I want among that leadership team, I want to set apart Barnabas and Saul to the work or the calling to which I have called them. Now, now look real carefully at the word over there, the work, the calling to which I've called them. See, they followed the Lord to uh, Antioch. They've been teaching large numbers of people. And God says, all right, great things are happening at that church. And I want to take what's going on there. And I want it to reach the entire Roman Empire. I want to take the gospel message, God said, to the parts of the Roman Empire where people have never heard the truth of God's love in their entire life. It's interesting to me. It says, set apart for the work to which I've called them. We go back to the verse where we started. And it says, God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You see, from the beginning of time, God had set Barnabas all apart because he knew what was going to happen being an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. And they had been set apart to do exactly what they were doing. They, they were just, you know, doing some amazing things as God began to take them and they began to go to parts of the world that where the gospel had never been shared. People hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and all, all the things that were happening. Now again, I want you to know something. Following the call of God does not always involve a moving truck. It does not mean you've got to move to Africa or you know, South America or, or something like that. Sometimes it's a one time. I need, I need you to pray for this person. I need you to talk to this person. I need you to minister to this person. I, I need you to do this or that. And it can be isolated events along the way. And every once in a while, there is a moment like Barnabas and Saul had where God says, okay, I need you to pick up everything you got 
and you're going to go to a new place. You're going to march off your map. That's true. But at the same time, remember God summoned uh, Barnabas to leave Jerusalem, go down to Antioch. He summoned him to go get Saul and some amazing things happened. And now God said, I need you to, to, to shift in your perspective to literally have a radical change of life. And that brings me to the fifth one. The fifth element as God prepares us to pursue his calling is that God often taps into areas of our life where he's already developed what I would say, okay, not credibility, but expertise. Credibility is more like who we are. Expertise is in something that we know, something that we do very, very well. And so Paul, uh, he changed his name from Saul to Paul, so he'd have credibility with the non-Jewish people. And Barnabas ended up back in Antioch. And I want you to see a story that unfolds, and we find that due to their expertise, they're summoned to be a key role player in something that happened. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, we find certain people came down from Judea, uh, and they came down to Antioch, and they were teaching the believers that you have to be circumcised, not only saved, but you have to be circumcised according to the custom of Moses. And if you aren't circumcised, then you can't be saved. So what happened next? Well, we see that uh, Barnabas and, and Paul are brought into sharp debate with what was going on. And they uh, began um, to you know, have intense debates and discussions. So it finds out they were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to visit with the apostles to talk and answer some questions about this and share what all was happening. We come to verse 4. When they come to Jerusalem, they reported, to God, uh, reported everything God had done through them. They talked about their amazing first missionary experience and all the things that had happened in Antioch. And they began to share all that with the apostles and the elders and all who were there listening. And then we see the, some of the believers who were of the circumcision group, the, of the Pharisee background. They stand up and they said, no, 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 we believe you have to have, be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. Not only say, but there's something else that needs to be a part of it. They go back to Barnabas and Saul, and the whole assembly was quiet, and Barnabas and Paul began telling them about all the amazing wonders God had done. So here the audience was listening, and we have a group of people who were Christians and yet had a religious background of being in Jewish life, and they're arguing, yeah, you got to be saved, and then added some kind of legalistic to, uh, legalism to it. They hear Barnabas and Paul, and they're talking about the amazing wonders only God could do. And as they began to listen, they began to see one is of man and one is of God. And finally, James, the, the leader there of the church, said, It's my judgment, having listened and obviously talked to the others around, therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. James was like, listen, this is about God and people. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about laws. It's not about trying to drag from the Old Testament stuff that needs to stay there. But this is a matter of God having a relationship with people. And so there we were. There, 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 there they were gathered together celebrating this amazing conclusion to all that happened. And that a letter went out to all over the churches, all over the Roman Empire, sharing with them what was happening. Let me give you an example, just real simple. In our church in Atlanta, we had a guy who uh, owned a restaurant, ran a restaurant, could cook really well. The restaurant got shut down during some economic challenges that we all recall. And in that time, he got active at our church. And God leveraged his expertise in buying food for our church and maintaining the kitchen in our church and actually doing Wednesday night meals. I mean, we, we had people from other churches who said, oh, we have chicken fingers or we have green beans or we have, you know, fish sticks. What do you guys have? And I remember one time I said, well, we, we're having garlic baked salmon uh, and rice. And they're like, what? I said, yeah, man, we're having first class. He, he literally was taking his meals from his uh, wonderful restaurant. He was cooking them for our church and charging costs for them. You, you know, for $6, you could get a, a meal that was like $25.99 at his restaurant. And it was such a great time. So God took this man's expertise, leveraged it to create a ministry in our church, a ministry of food to people and families who could come and join us on Wednesday night. As you're thinking about all of this, man, it sounds so exciting. 
that God's got a call. God's got something for you to do. God's going to leverage your credibility and your giftedness and your experience and, and areas where you're growing in expertise. And, and, and God's going to use all these things for a calling on your life. Let me give you two cautions. And these two cautions were seen in the life of Barnabas himself. The first caution is this. Remember, we all, all have areas of what I would call temptation that can draw our heart or our emotions, our desires away from our calling. We all have this emotional component about us, this, this temptation part, this heart string element of our life that can draw us away from the calling God has upon our lives. We go back to Acts and we see in chapter 15 that some time passed. And Paul says, hey, let's go back to the churches where we visited and let's visit them and see how they're doing and encourage them, just like we did with the people in Antioch. Barnabas loved the idea and said, let's, let's take John Mark along. And Barnabas said, no, no, no. He abandoned us last time really early on. Let's not take John Mark because we can't run the risk of another abandonment. And, and I don't really trust him. Uh, you know, his credibility is gone in my eyes. And Barnabas and Paul had such a sharp disagreement that Barnabas took John Mark and left. And Paul took a guy named Silas and they left. They, they literally parted company. You think, why was, uh, why, why, why was Barnabas so obsessed with John Mark? Well, we go to the book of Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. And, uh, and we discover uh, this, that John Mark, that's an incorrect verse, but John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. It was a family thing. That, that Barnabas had a yearning for John Mark to go because it was family. You can imagine his encouragement. He was like, okay, hey, John Mark, I want to encourage you. Yeah, you bailed the first time, but you're going to be with us this time. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to persevere with us. You're going to do some great, great things, and, and I'm excited about what you're going to do. And Paul was like, no. And sometimes, even meaning well, our hearts can lead us astray. The second one is very similar to it, and it is this, that uh, remember, all that we have, all the areas we have can draw our heads away. The, not temptation with heart, but frailty with head. There are ways of thinking we have that are faulty because none of us have a perfect mind or a totally transformed mind. And many times in those moments, the way we think can draw us away from the very calling God's given us. And again, we don't go to Book of Acts. This time we go to Galatians chapter 2. And Simon Peter shows up, Cephas shows up, and uh, he's, he's eating with the Gentiles. But then some people come down from Jerusalem, and, and Peter begins to draw away from people, <clears throat> not really want to be around the Gentiles anymore. And Paul, man, he, he, he confronts them. And, and Peter's doing this out of fear, according to what Paul writes. And look at the bottom. It even led Barnabas astray. What was the issue there? Well, again, in the thinking of Barnabas, yeah, he loved people, an encourager. And sometimes in that realm, you're a people pleaser. And in this moment, Barnabas chose to please people instead of to please God. It was a faulty way of thinking in his mind. And when tempted, the frailty of thought drew him away. So just be aware as you begin pursuing the calling of God, whether it's a, it's a lifestyle of change or maybe a momentary calling to do this, do this, do this, that the desires of your heart, sometimes the temptations can draw you away. And the frailty of your thinking, maybe, you know, a little, uh, a bad way of thinking that's in your mind can draw you away easily. So as we come to the end, I'd like to finish out by, you just look at the five things we talked about, the five truths of pursuing God's calling. As you <clears throat> begin to review them and begin to think about them, the question would be today to begin to pray, God, as I'm thinking about all five, what is your calling upon my life? And uh, perhaps you're watching this and you're, and you're thinking, well, you know, could you pray with me about this? Could you uh, maybe provide a listening ear? I've got some questions about the message. Perhaps I'd like to ask you about this calling by God. Uh, you know, the frailty of thought or the temptation of heart. You know, I'm kind of wondering, could I ask him questions? Maybe like take a step of faith. You'd like to share, hey man, I just sense God calling me to, to be a missionary, be a pastor, or to go into the business world and create maybe a Bible study where I am or something like that. And you're, you're needing some help and encouragement. You need some tools and resources. We have different ways you can reach out to us and we'd love for you to do one of two ways. Either shoot me a card there over at the mailing address, 201 East 6th Street, 
Rinkin, Georgia 31326, or you can shoot me an email at gary.lewis at fbcrinkin.com. And again, we invite you to take the step God's leading you to take. Questions, step of faith, need prayer? Maybe today God's shown you something, a calling on your life, and you'd like us to celebrate with you on that. And finally, each week we always like to highlight, if you're giving money through our local church, that like, where's it going? And obviously in our mind and hearts right now with all the events unfolding in Ukraine, man, that's on the forefront of our mind. I'd like to introduce you to this website. You can go there and check it out at UPFM, uh, excuse me, upfmissions.org. Um, and uh, through our partnership with the International Mission Board, we are a part of the Ukrainian Baptist Theological Seminary and the people there that are actually ministering to the people amidst the war. And so if you're giving money through our church, some of that's going directly to, to help out there. But if you'd like to up your investment financially, man, you can go right here to this website and you can be a part of what's happening there. And you can see they're providing right now food, shelter, clothing, medicine, fuel, transportation, ministering to people, psychological assistance, whatever the need is. The people I just talked about are seminary students and they've shifted from being in the classroom to living in a war and really reaching out and ministering to the people that are there. And we'd invite you to financially partner with us in helping these efforts. And again, each week we remind you there are many, many different ways to give. If you have any questions, you can visit fbcrinkin.com and uh, .org. Sorry about fbcrinkin.org. Check us out and uh, learn more about being involved with us. Father, thank you again for all you've shared and giving us a sacred calling. And I pray that all of us would follow it, whatever it might be, and live out the calling you've invited us to, to pursue, whether it's a unique one thing, maybe it's a total lifestyle change or a combination thereof, that we would pursue that calling with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care and have a great week.